So, as we get into the last part of this um, summer series we're going through, turn with me in your Bible to the Song of Solomon, chapter 6. <clears throat> the Song of Solomon, chapter 6. We're going to overview this chapter, and, and hopefully we can get through it all. Song of Solomon chapter 6, and the title of this message is, Are You Fighting Fair? Part 3. Are You Fighting Fair? Part 3. Now, in part 1 of this study, we saw two things that we're not to do in conflict. Uh, number one, we do not react, meaning that we do not reenact what your spouse has done to you. We saw number two, allow God to change other people, meaning leave your spouse in God's hands. And we saw how effective this was when God convicted the wife here in the story when she acted in selfishness towards her husband. Then we saw in part two of this study that we should have liquid myrrh dripping from our lips, which means that we are to be forgiving and that we are willing to bury the past. Then we saw that the wife described Solomon's hands in such loving terms, meaning that in conflict, we should never allow it to get physical. Men, you should never put your hands on a woman in a way that is unbiblical and ungodly, and vice versa. Ladies, stay out of your husband's face. Stay out of his face. I keep, t I keep telling you, men are just physically stronger than women. You get all up in his face, and he just one stiff arm, and you flying across the room. Stay out of his face. Stay out. Now, we're going to look at how to communicate with our spouses. And as I mentioned before, this goes for communication in any relationship. And for those who are single here, put this in your hip pocket because later on you're going to wish you had listened. When you get into a marriage and you're going to say, now, what was that Pastor Tony was saying? No, you should have been... Our singles, each one of you should have a notebook and a pen with you taking serious notes because you're going to need this later. I'm telling you now, you're going to need it. And so we're going to talk about how to communicate with our spouses and how to listen to what they are saying. Men, pay close attention because what I am about to say can save you a lot of headaches in your marriage. There are too many women frustrated over the lack of communication and lack of really listening to them. Women are excellent communicators for the most part. They love to talk. Just love to talk. Just talk, talk, talk. Just talk, 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 talk. And then once you finish talking, you want to talk some more. So you're, you're excellent when it comes to communicating and things, and, and, and we, we're, we're not wired that way. You know, <laughs> let me just tell this joke and get, and get, it, get it out of the way, because this is really in my mind. <laughs> Some lady's going to struggle in heaven. <laughs> Revelation 8.1 says there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. <laughs> Some of y'all going to struggle. <laughs> what am I to talk about? Uh, silence. You know. That was just free right there. Now... Now, remember we left off with Solomon's wife going out to look for, uh, 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 look for him to apologize for ignoring his needs and acting in selfishness. And, and, and this, is a free, this is a freebie right now. Always be quick to apologize. Couple, do you hear me? And not only for couples, period. Be quick to apologize when you offend your spouse or when you offend someone. Why? Because the more time you allow to pass before you apologize, watch this, Satan will give you a reason not to apologize and give you justification for why you shouldn't apologize. So be quick to apologize like this woman did. And it's, this is in my notes, so I just didn't come up with that. Now, let's look at verses one and two. 
It says, where has uh, your beloved gone, O fairest among women? Where has your beloved turned aside that uh, we may seek him with you? And verse 2 says, my beloved has gone to his garden, to the bed of spices, to feed his flock in the garden, and to gather lilies. Now, Solomon's harem Ask her in verse 1, where is your beloved? And she responded by saying he is in his garden and feeding his flock. Notice how she knows right where to find him. Men, when you're in conflict, does your wife know where to find you? Notice how she can answer to his whereabouts. She is not calling all of his friends, asking, have you seen so-and-so? Notice how he was not in the bar or club, drinking or dancing his problems away. No, he was in his garden feeding his flock. Gardens in the Bible seem to imply the place to get along with God. Adam got along with God in the garden of Eden, according to Genesis 3, 9. Jesus went to the garden of Gethsemane to get along and to talk to the Father just before he went to the cross, according to Matthew 26 and verses 36 to 46. Men, let us go to our gardens when we are in conflict with our wives. Let us go to the place where we can get along with God. Let me ask you this, men, do you even have a garden? Oh, yeah, I got one. I, you know, I got some peppers back there. And, two, and I'm not talking about that garden. Do you have a place that you can get along, that you daily go to, that you can get along to be with God, where your will is crushed? Just like Jesus said in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, oh, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Do you have a garden you can go to where your will can be crushed? And so God's will can be seen through. You go to the garden in conflict and, and God will crush your will and say, you were wrong. You need to go and apologize. See, you stay out of the garden, then you feel I'm right. But as you go to the garden, that place to get along with God, that's where God will begin to crush your will so his will can be done. His will is reconciliation. His will is getting it right. Our will is being on spite. And no, no, they need to be coming to me. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. But when we go to the garden, like Jesus went to the garden, that's where our will will be crushed. If you go, instead of going to the garden, you go to the TV, then you'll be sitting there stewing as you're watching the game and saying, when is she coming in to apologize to me? Oh, it's an, another commercial went by. It's halftime now. She still have not come in here. See, see now you cook it. See, you, you hot now. But if you go to the garden, to the place of prayer, to the place where you get alone to be with God, that's where God will begin to crush our will and, and crush our right to be right. And so Jesus can be seen in us. Let our wives know, man, let our wives know where to find us in conflict. See, this goes back to being a shepherd king in chapter 1. Solomon was a shepherd king in, in chapter 1. This means not only was he a shepherd to lead his family spiritually, but he was also a king who looked out for those under him. See, singles, this is why it's so important to get you a shepherd king and not just a shepherd king that's on the weekends. Or oh, he's shepherd king on the weekend when he come, he'll come to church with you. No, you need an everyday shepherd king. 
See, because, see, you will know when you got one, you know where to find him in this garden, feeding his flock and getting along with the Lord. There are many people who say, you know, I just want to find the Lord. First of all, he isn't missing. <laughs> no, he isn't lost. We are. He isn't. He isn't lost. But you find Jesus in the place of prayer. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane in the place of prayer. That's where you find Jesus. He's one prayer away. He's just waiting on you. The Bible says his ear is attentive to our prayers. That's where you find Jesus in the place of prayer. Look at verse 3. He says, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. He feeds his flock among the lilies. And notice the phrase, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. You know, I keep, I can't get this out of my mind. When we, when my wife and I, when we were teenagers, you know, we used to get these little shirts, you know, I am his, he is mine. And we walk around little teeny boppers, you know, little, you know, walk around the amusement park and, and you see us with the same shirt on, you know, we're twinning and, you know, and then on the back, I'm his and I, she is mine. You know. And so when I read this, I just could put a smile on my face. God, this is what it reminded me of. She is saying, no matter what conflict comes our way, we belong to one another. She knew where to find him, and he knew where to find her. Ladies, notice, notice that during conflict, she didn't run home to her mama. This is one of four major problems in a marriage. Watch this. In-laws. The man's mother coming in between him and his wife. The wife's mother coming in between her daughter and her husband. In-laws, back away from your children's marriages. I want you to notice the common denominator. His mother and her mother. What is the common denominator? Smothers. <laughs> Men, we don't care. We, we're constantly telling the, our wives, stay out of it. Let them figure it out. We have to figure it out. Let them figure it out. Now, the only way you intervene if there's abuse. That's the only time you step in. Stay out. As my, my boys used to say growing up, they used to say, fall back. Step away. Like I said, unless there's abuse. So this leads me to give you the four major problems in all marriages. Four major problems. Number one, we already talked about the man's mother. Number one. Number two, the woman's mother. Two. Number three, sex. And number four, money. That's, that's obvious. These are obvious things here. And, and now that you know the four major problems, there are three things you're not to do when you're in conflict. A, for you note takers, A, don't run home to your mother unless there is abuse taking place. B, don't stump out the door. I'm going to come back to that one. C, don't go off with friends to talk about your spouse. I'm going to come back to that one too. Now, look at verse 4. Oh, my love, you are as beautiful as Terza. Lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. I, I want you to notice something. Notice what are the first words to his wife as they were coming together for reconciliation. They were words of praise. He called her his love and he spoke of her beauty. He didn't say, that's right, you need to be coming to me to apologize because you know you were wrong. You know it right, don't you? As, as she's coming, you, you know you were wrong. You, you, you're right. Keep coming. Keep on coming. No. He talked about her beauty. He sung her praises. It, it, it reminded me of King Ahasuerus in the book of Esther. When she came in because the previous wife, Vasti, he wanted to show off her beauty. She was good looking. 
And so he had all his boys together. He wanted to parade her around, say, have Vashti come on out. And she said, I ain't coming out there. She said, I ain't coming out. They said, uh, the king asked for you to come on out. She said, you tell him I ain't coming. See, that's the all the one thinking these women with these subservient kind of, you know, limp wrist kind of went. No. Vashti said, no, I'm not coming out. So they said, oh, 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 is this, oh, that's what type of time she's on. She said, okay. King Ahasuerus said, look here. Somebody advised him and said, look, hey, if they hear, if all these other rulers hear what your wife did, our wife's going to be tripping like that. So look here, you got to do something. <laughs> Say, all right, kick through the curb. You don't want to come out? Hit the road. Maybe hit the road. So I'm going to give me a new wife. And all of a sudden, that's when they did the little beauty contest, you know, you know the beauty contest they had, and, 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 and Esther won. So, but they had a rule. You cannot come and approach the, the, the king without being invited. They said, that's one thing we're we going to be about. And so Esther had not been invited for like 30 days. So they said, man, you got to go because this dude is trying to kill all the Jews and you a Jew, you think you're going to escape? You better go to the king. She said, I wasn't invited. They said, fast and pray. They fast and pray and all that kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden the door popped open and here's Esther. <laughs> she comes on through. Because of her beauty, all oh, the king couldn't resist. And he held out the scepter to her, said, come, put your hand on the scepter, meaning that I accept you. But it was her amazing beauty. This is an Esther 5 too. Man, how often do you tell your wife that she's beautiful? Or when was the last time you told her she's beautiful? And vice versa. When last time you told your husband, oh, you just a handsome thing. Yeah, he may have a done lap, his belly done lapped over his belly. He may have a done lap. <laughs> you ain't high school weight either. <laughs> so we just ought to just have this thing going both ways. That's why I said vice versa. And you know, you dying to get to high school weight again. I don't know why. You were a teenager. You get your grown folk body once you get, become a grown folk. I don't know why y'all dying to get to your high school weight. This is what I, I haven't wore this since high school. Like that's a badge of honor. You know, I told you only a dog want a bone. And then when he, what he does with the bone, he buries it. Man wants a one with some meat on her bone. I'm telling you. It's crazy. A man want a woman with meat on their bones and a woman is dying to lose weight. What kind of flip floppy kind of thing is that? It's crazy. Oh, I just see. Oh, have you seen these hips? Oh, well. Yeah, we've seen those hips. Yes. And like them a whole lot. I don't, I don't get this. It's some weird thing that happens. I, I don't understand. Men, you don't want other men to deposit beautiful points into your wife's emotional account. And none of this stuff, well, she knows it. Well, how? Because you told her? Well, back in 19 something you told her? Or did someone else tell her? See, this is what you got to understand. Solomon immediately talks about her beauty. He immediately sung her praises. I sing my wife's praises and I tell her she's beautiful a thousand times a day and that's no hyperbole. A thousand times a day and I try to get creative a thousand and all she tells me is not today. I'm like, yeah, today and every day. And we wake up again, oh, you just, look, you just so beautiful. Oh, not today. I said, why? Well, she said, today is Monday. I said, well, yeah, then today. Well, why not today? Well, it's Tuesday. Well, then today too. Yeah, every day. You're going to hear it every single day. See, because when she leaves the house 
And if any man said, oh, you're so beautiful, she'll probably roll her eyes and say, my husband told me a thousand times before I left the house. See, that, 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 that card will be rejected because she knows and I tell her a thousand times creatively a day. Then, 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 watch this, watch this. Then I go around, and then when I pass her, I just touch her. Touch her a little bit, let her know, I, I see you. <laughs> so she know whenever I'm near, she know, she, she know these mitts are going to touch her some kind of way. Just a little rub up here, just a little touch there, a little feel there. <laughs> it's on and popping. <laughs> because I just want her to know how I feel about her. Yeah, we've been together, oh, you know, over 42 years now. It's still on and popping. I rub down the side. And just <laughs> letting her know I'm near. Guess who's near? The one who just can't get enough of you. That's who's near. Yeah, that's, so she knows it. So it's none of this. I come up behind her. She's flinching and <clears throat> getting weird. No. No, she knows. She just knows if I'm in the room some kind of way, I'm going to find a way to pass her. So I can just let her know, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Your, hey, your boy is here. And, and that's the kind of stuff that happens. Look at verse 5. Look, verse 5. It says, turn your eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Gilead. Oh, Solomon landed on. Oh. Solomon is saying, turn away from me because you are too beautiful for me to even talk to you. This is called forgiveness. This is called reconciliation. He is humbling himself before his wife. He said, I can't even stand to be in your presence because of your beauty. King Ahasuerus was the same way. <laughs> he saw Esther and he just said, man, hey, I know what we decreed but this woman is fine and I can't get enough of her. And so here, here's that scepter, hold that scepter out. And this is what Solomon is doing here. Now look what it says. It speaks of she had his favor. Look at verses six and seven. It says, your teeth are like a flock of sheep which have come up from the washing. Everyone bears twins and none is barren among them. Like a piece of pomegranate are your temples behind your veil. Uh, and, and so let me just stop right there. His, his, his mouth was right. His teeth were white. None was missing. And, I, you know, I, his, his grill was right. It, it, it didn't look like he was, you know, chewing on bricks. His, his grill was right. Get your grill right. If your grill not right, get your grill right. Be, why? What, because, see, it's nothing like a beautiful smile. There's nothing like it. My wife has one of the best smiles in all the earth. She, he said, notice he said that the, the teeth are white. Look like they just came up from, from the washing. Teeth are white. It, behind that chocolate skin, those big bright choppers in her mouth, she has the beautiful smile that lights up the world. This, if, if, you, if your grill isn't right, get your grill right. It doesn't, get to, everybody got a in, little insurance, a little something. Get your grill right. Go to Dennis and say, yo, my pastor said I need to get my grill right. <laughs> so so you, 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 get it, you get it right. That's, that's all. You know, these, these, now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. These are the same words he used to describe her, watch this, on their honeymoon. See, that's the thing you have to, see, showing her that his love for her had not diminished since that honeymoon night. Couples, has your love for one another diminished 
or deepened since your honeymoon. So often couples grow apart in marriage, especially when children start to come, where she pours herself into children. He pours himself into his career. We talked about that uh, before. They forgot to what it, what it means to date one another. They forgot what you did to get her. You got to do to keep her. And I just, you know, it's just something for you to think about. And, and, and has your love diminished for one another or deepened? Has it become a situation where a butler is married to a maid? And, and so often, especially for those who have been um, married for, I would say, maybe 20 plus years and longer. So often it can just become a roommate situation. And, and I refuse to allow that to happen. I, I, that's why I said I, I tell my wife in creative ways how beautiful she is. I'm always going to come by and, and touch her and, rub, and just rub up against her, so to speak. And just I'm always going to do that kind of stuff, even though we've been together for decades. Because I don't, I don't want... I don't want our relationship to diminish because we've been together. We've seen each other from teenagers all the way up until today. We, we, we started dating as teenagers. So I, I don't want that to happen. And so often it's easy to happen because you know why? Because what has been entered into the equation is called L-I-F-E, life. Life comes in and just it can rip a couple apart if we don't watch it, next, you know, we look up and, you know, kids start coming. Then because kids stuff is every day, we look up and, and next thing you know, we've been married 15 years. You're like, whoa, where did that, you know, and you look up now, the little baby is now about to go to high school. And it's just like, you, you kidding me? I, I was just talking to my, um, my granddaughter yesterday and, and I asked her, I said, your birthday coming up. Are you about to turn eight years old? And she said, yes. I said, oh, my goodness. Time, the way time goes. I, I was talking to my, my son. I don't get a chance to see my oldest son nor my oldest grandson because they live in Indiana. I don't get to see them as much. And he sent me a picture, and he said, he said I'm just going to my son's middle school orientation. I said, middle school? I'm thinking he's still in the second grade. <laughs> you see how time goes? Time can, can go so rapidly, and we need, to, we need to watch this, watch that. Look at verses 8 through 10. It says, <clears throat> there are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. And it says, um, my dove, my perfect one, is the only one. The only one of her mother, the favorite of the one who bore her, the daughter saw her and called her blessed, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. And who is she who looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, are awesome as an army with banners? This, this, this is called forgiveness. Solomon is saying in verse 8, there is no one like you. Then he says, you are my dove. He says, my perfect one in verse 9. Ladies, <laughs> my dove. I, a dove, as you heard me mention before, is a dove that is a bird that's very loyal. Uh, it's, it speaks of its purity, its loyal. Um, you know, and it's an incredible bird. So he described his, and trustworthy as well. So he described his wife as a dove. <laughs> Ladies. If your husbands were to describe you with a bird, which bird would he use? A hawk? All you do is squawk? Would he describe you as a peacock? You just want to be seen. How would he describe, how would he describe you? I was just thinking about this. Matter of fact, this morning, as, as I was looking at that, I said, oh, he called her a dove. And I said, I wonder what some of these men have called their wives. 
<laughs> and some, some of them, are, you know, some, some of the men are looking like this. Pastor Tony, leave that alone. <laughs> leave, <laughs> leave that alone. <laughs> but, you know, he is saying, I love you so much. I don't even remember what you did to me. You are my perfect one. You can't do any wrong in my eyesight. Isn't this how God is to us? He loves us so much that he purposes in his heart not to remember our sins against him. He, 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 he forgives us and remembers our sins no more. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 34 says, I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. This is what Solomon is doing here. In other words, Solomon is acting like God in the home. Man, pay close attention. This is how we should act in our homes, to act godly or godlike. Men, fathers, you don't realize how important our roles are in the home. We're told to be godly in the home because when our children grow up and hear that God wants to be our heavenly father, the first thing our children are going to do is compare that with our fathering. And they are going to wonder if God is going to run out on them or talk to them or treat them like you as a father did to them growing up. They're going to question the eternal love of God because they never had a father in their home who loved them. Or if he is in the home, he was so disconnected from the family and so unloving. Men, if this is you, you need to get some help. This is not natural to be just disconnected from the family. Family is going on, you just go off all the time. Go off somewhere. Now you have to engage that family you help produce. You got to be involved in some kind of way. Solomon was acting godly and godlike in the home, and he didn't hold her sin against her. Look at verses 11 and 12. I went down to the garden of nuts, or is a walnut kind of garden, to see the uh, verdure, which is a lush green vegetation of the valley, to see whether the vine had budded and the pomegranates had bloomed. And it says in verse 12, before I was even aware, my soul had um, made me as the chariots of my noble people. This is the ultimate of reconciliation. He forgives her to the point where he was parading her on his chariot in front of all the people. He took her down to the garden uh, in verse 11, down to the lush valley. Uh, then down to where the pomegranates had bloomed. In other words, he was treating her as if no conflict had ever taken place. This is true forgiveness, treating a person like nothing had ever taken place. Do you forgive like this? Or do you forgive like the world does? I forgive you, but I won't forget. That means that I'm going to dangle this over your head and I'm going to use it like a trump card. Whenever I need to pull it out, I'm going to pull it out because I'm never going to forget what you did to me. See, this is the example Solomon is showing us, a treating a person, treating his wife as if the conflict never happened. This is why we lead, need the Lord in our lives. He gives us his Holy Spirit to empower us to live out what we can't live on our own. Look at verse 13. Return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. And what would you see in the Shulamite, as it were, the dance of two camps? Now, Shulamite, this is a nickname. In Hebrew, it is the feminine form of Solomon's name, which means she belongs to me. Watch this. She is a part of me. The Bible said the two shall become one. She's a part of me. Do you see how they drew closer to one another through conflict? This verse ends with a party of dancing at the end of verse 13, showing us two things. Number one, conflict brought them closer together. And number two, conflict brought joy in the end. So what helps us to forgive others when we realize how much we have been forgiven? Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Are you having a hard time forgiving someone? 
Look at the cross. See how much you have been forgiven. And it will help you to forgive others. See, Jesus is dying on the cross for your sin, your lust, your unforgiveness, your anger, your spitefulness. See, it's easy to say, Jesus died for the sin of the world. Yeah. But when you say, Jesus died for my sin, specifically, uh, then that changes the game. So, let's quickly look at these communication things. These, uh, don't look at the number, the 13 in communication during conflict, and then the seven on how to listen. We're going to run through them quickly so you can have an idea what to do and what not to do. Uh, number one, don't speak too soon. Or don't jump the gun during conflict. Hear your mate out. I have this bad. I have this very bad. I'm ready to jump in. Every little phrase of the, uh, my wife's trying to get something out, and I'm trying to jump in and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. And she always has to say, I wasn't finished. I'm like, but you're taking too long. <laughs> because I got to answer that piece in the very beginning. And, you know, I say, I might forget by the time you finish your dissertation. She said, that ain't my problem, that's yours. That you can't remember. So I have a problem with this jumping in. I I have a problem. Uh, Proverbs 18, 13 says, he who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. So that's me. Number two, don't confront your mate publicly. Do it behind closed doors. I quoted this last week, Proverbs 12, 4. It says, he, a woman who causes shame to her husband, her husband is like rottenness to his bones. You don't want your husband to die on the inside because you cause him shame by publicly confronting him. Either in, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Number three, don't confront your mate before the kids. That's what I was about to say. Because you give them an okay on how they are to talk to their parent. When they hear you doing it, they feel, okay, well, it must be, you know, it's not off limits. I can talk this way. You, you give them an example. That's not right. Number four, don't use the kids. Don't bring them into the argument. Johnny, you remember our mommy said this last night. You were there. You were there. You were finishing up your cookie, and mommy said that. And the, oh, the, stop. Leave little Johnny and this little snot nose and cookie out of it. Leave him out. So don't use the kids to fight with. Number five, don't say you never or you always. You never and you always because they will come up with a, a time 10 years ago that you did. So don't do that. Don't do it. Number six, uh, don't get historical. Uh, Don't bring up the past. Have liquid myrrh dripping from your lips. We talked about that. Number seven, don't raise your voice. Uh, Proverbs 15 verse one says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stirs up anger. Talk sweetly to them. We talked about that last week. Well, I can't help it. You know, my, my family loud. We just loud. And I'm, I'm just loud. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. So you can't help it. Number eight, don't call names. You jerk, you dog, B word or worse. There's folks stringing four-letter words together like, like it's a hobby or something. Don't do it. Number nine, don't mention family. My mother said you would be no good. I should have listened to her. Number 10, don't win. Press for resolution, not victory. Number 11, don't condescend. Speak person to person, not like a parent reprimanding a child. Ladies, your husband is not your child, even though he may do childish things. He's not your child and vice versa. Number 12, don't demean. Men and women, don't make your spouse feel like the scum of the earth because you just demean them with your words and the way you talk. And you're just so condescending and you talk to them. Uh, now, let me say this again so you can understand. Stop it, you arrogant little thing. Stop it. Stop talking to them like that. They're not some little child that you got to talk to them like that. You know, like, oh, you, because so often those with a lot of education, they come off like that. Oh, 
let me help you th with this. And they come with some, some words they got from the university and they're just they're making you feel stupid. <laughs> you know, stop. Make them feel like the scum of the earth. Number 13, don't force a quiet person to talk. Quiet people, you should be saying amen. <laughs> don't push them into a corner before they're ready to talk. Ladies, you got this bad. He's not ready to talk right now. And it's time to talk is not doing sports center or a game. It's not time to talk, but if you love me, you'll turn that off. Cut it out. We love you, but we want to see this game too or see this highlight. We love you. It's not time to talk right now. I'm, I'm going to give you half-cocked answers. Caveman kind of talk. Yeah? If you say so, you know, whatever. You know, you're like, oh, is that all you have? Well, you're talking to me when this game is on. Then we turn it off. Then we're sitting there stewing, like, oh, I wonder what's happening now. Oh, I'm, you know, what's going on? Did we score? You know, and we're not listening. So, how would your mate describe your communication skills? Hmm. Now we're going to quickly look at the seven ways to listen. Number one, listen with your face. Men, we're not listening while we're still watching TV or on the phone. Ladies, please understand that as well. We're not listening to you. If you, if you see us in the middle of, you know, firing off a text or we in the middle of we engaged in this game, you heard a couple of, as you were coming up the stairs or whatever, coming in the room, you heard us say, yeah, yeah. And, and, and then all of a sudden you want to come in and talk about the bills. And, and that's not the time to do that. We're not going to listen. And Pastor Tony said, listen with your face. You come up and grab his face and turn it like this. We're going to be hot. <laughs> we ain't ready to listen to nothing. Is he, is he going to tell girl, you better get on out of here with that mess. Those bills will still be there tomorrow. So, but we got to listen with our face. Number two, do not reason with your mate. Man, we got this bad. Men, don't say, honey, okay. All right, you want to talk? Okay. We pause it. Okay. Now, the, the reason why this is X, Y, and Z is the problem and conversation is over. God bless you. Let me get back to the game. No, no. Whoa, 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 whoa. So often our wives aren't looking for a reason. They just want us to hear them out. <sighs> See, that's the thing we have to understand. They just, we, we, we're, we're problem solvers. We, we just want to we just want to solve the problem and get back to the game or get back to the phone or whatever. We want to solve the problem. Okay, honey, we're, okay, now this is what I'm thinking. Then do, okay, honey, before you even get started, the problem is this. Here's the solution, X, Y, and Z. If we do that, everything will be good. God bless. See you later. Back to... That. And so often they don't want a, a, a solution. They just, want us to, they, they just want us to know that they got a voice too. And they got some wisdom as, as well. Number three, do not argue. When you argue, no one is being heard. No, so often when an argument is taking place, there's loud voices. Nobody's hearing each other. And it's just crazy. Number four, do not interrupt. I told you I have this problem bad because I'm wired to debate. And sometimes I bring this into the conflict with my wife and she constantly saying I'm, I wasn't finished. And I'm like, when are you going to get finished? And I'm not listening because I'm still got my, I got my answer in the, in, the, in the chamber and I'm ready to shoot it off in the chamber. And because, you know, I'm really not listening. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. She's almost finished. She's almost finished. Okay. She should be finished by now. And then I fire off my answer. I ain't even really hear the words she's saying. See, I got this bad. So, number five, do not stomp out the door. Man up and face the problem. Cowards and little children stomp out. You know, they get mad, you know, and boom, boom, boom. You know, that's what, that's what kids do. Um, and, and, and we're not to, you know, we're not to, to do this. And, and then do not vent to others. Remember I said I was coming back to that. This is breaking trust. Meaning do not talk to someone else without your spouse knowing about it. Ladies, men, oh boy, we do not like this. We don't do well with this. Because they're looking, they wonder why everybody's looking at them crazy at the family reunion. Uh, we know what you've done. We know what you did. 
You know, and they're looking at us all crazy. And you're like, well, why are they looking at us like this? Oh, there's a reason why. So you broke trust. And you're not to do the number seven. No rude body language. Stop crossing your arms and turning your back. Or if you don't turn your back, you just kind of kind of semi-turn. The, the shoulder. And see, they right over, they, they right over here. You just kind of get... And then on the couch, sitting on the couch, one is on one end, one is on the other. Or if they are next to each other, the wife will kind of just, she said, I'm next to you, but I'm, I'm really not next to you. See, we got to stop all that. We got to stop all that. So how would your mate describe your listening skills? Which one of these, you need God's help? I have a problem with interrupting. What about you? Do you stomp out? Do you badmouth your spouse to other people or family members? Or in your little sibling chat? Your little sibling, you know that sibling uh, text chat y'all, y'all have? Is that where you badmouth them? He thinking everything good and you just thrashing him. And that little, fam, that little family chat, you know. See, do you see how much we need God's help? We can't do this on our own. Let me conclude with this. What are you sensing God saying to you? Is he saying that you need to forgive your spouse? Is he saying that you need to get some help in communicating or listening better? Maybe you're here and you are always running home to your mother or stomping out. What is God speaking to your heart about this behavior? Men, how are you representing God in the home? What view of God are you showing your children? Are you showing them the view that God is an angry God, an unloving God, an unforgiving God, a non-committed God? Maybe God is saying that you need to get some help in this area. Psalm 46 verse 1 says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Meaning that he is present today to help in our time of trouble. And many of our marriages and relationships are in trouble. Will you turn to him today for help? Or will you continue to try to fix it yourself? Turn to Christ today as Lord and Savior by repenting of your sins and giving him the control of your life. He's here to help. You can't do any of this if you're not a Christian, if you never committed your life to Jesus Christ. You can't do any of these things. Only a life committed to Christ. This couple was committed to, to God. And that's why these things worked for this couple. You can't do it. I can't do it without the Lord's help. Will you cry out for his help today? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time you've given us. Lord, thank you for being so good to us and sharing these things with us. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who has not committed their lives to Jesus Christ, repented of their sins and believed that Jesus died on the cross and was buried and rose again, if they confess that, Lord, your word said they shall be saved. Lord, I pray for the marriages that are in trouble, the relationships that are in trouble. I pray, God, uh, for people that's trying to fix it themselves. And Lord, you have given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Lord, may we turn to you for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. As you can see, some wonderful people available to pray with you uh, about what the Lord has spoken to your heart. This is, this is what they're up here for. The Lord is a very present help in time of trouble. There are relationships, there are marriages, there are lives that are in trouble. Come, as the worship team sings, let them uh, sing the last song. Let them, these wonderful people, pray for you and with you at this time. God bless you. Again, this is your moment. This is your opportunity. The Lord is speaking on how we ought to seek reconciliation, how to love one another rightly, reflect the love that he has shown to us. If you are in need of of prayer today, this is the moment. There are folks here ready to pray with you, folks here throughout the space ready to receive and pray with you on how we ought to live rightly before the Lord. So don't delay. Come forward and get things right with the Lord as we sing.
Father, we thank you that in our weakness, 
we're made strong. You say, Lord, that your grace is sufficient for us. So, Lord, when we have fallen, where we have done these things wrong, incorrectly, we've brought shame to ourselves, Lord, in poor action. Your grace covers us, not to continue in sin, thinking grace may abound. No. But grace that gives us an, op an opportunity to follow hard after you, to seek the right way, to live at peace with all men as much as it depends upon us. So God, as we leave this place, let us do just that. Seek your face evermore, seeking you and your strength to make us stronger. Guide us, Lord, we pray by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Hey, if you still need prayer, there's still folks here who would love to pray with you. You don't need to rush out. And there's an opportunity for prayer still. What an awesome message from Senior Pastor Tony Clark. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus, click the link below. We have a free gift we'd like to give you, as well as some information about your next steps in following Jesus. There's also a link if you simply need prayer or if you want to share with us some encouraging things that God is doing in your life right now. Lastly, if you've been blessed by the ministry at Calvary Chapel Newport News, consider partnering with us financially. There's a giving link that you can click below or you can text Calvary NN to 77977. Your financial gift helps us to reach the world with the message of Jesus Christ. God bless you, and until next time, continue reaching up, in, around, and out.